Good evening, everyone. As a preliminary matter, this is Dr. Burnham, Superintendent of Schools. I will do a roll call to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Chair, Mrs. Carol Ashambo. Yes. Vice Chair, Mr. Brian Layton, and will be late in, an, in arriving to the meeting. Uh, Secretary, Mrs. Laura Kelly. Yes. Ms. Sophie Shapiro. Yes. And Mr. Anthony Scombrini is not, oh, he's just coming into the meeting now. Mr. Scolombrini, can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes. Thank you. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Recording Secretary, Ms. Susan Summers. Yes. And Business Manager, Mr. Michael Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy, can you confirm you can hear me? Yes. Thank you. All right, I'll turn it back to you, Mrs. Ajambo. All righty. In accordance with the requirements of the open meeting law, Please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and will be broadcast over the Lunenburg Public Access Channel and streaming on Facebook Live at a later time. And this meeting of the Lunenburg School Committee is being conducted remotely. In accordance with the governor's orders suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, public meetings may be conducted remotely. The order, which you can find posted on the town website on the COVID-19 Information Center page, access through the town manager's webpage allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Lunenburg School Committee is convening by telephone conference, video conference, via Zoom app, Facebook Live, as posted on the town's website, identifying on how the public may join. For Zoom meetings, please note that this meeting is being recorded and that attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and that you take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Meeting business ground rules before we turn to um, the first item on the agenda. Um, I, Carol Ashambo, the chair, will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go and ask members to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold till your name is called. And remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourselves. And finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. So for the first item on the agenda, we have the chair's report. And I wish to begin by congratulating all members of the class of 2022 on their graduation. I'm sure the community joins with me as I wish you the very best as you move forward to new adventures and challenges. I'd also like to thank all members of the high school staff for all their time and effort that went into making graduation such a very special day. The Commissioner of Education sent a communication to all school committee chairs outlining the federal fund program we refer to as ESSER 1, 2, and 3, and reminding us of the spending deadlines. I'd like to thank Dr. Burnham and Mr. Cassidy for their transparency and forward planning in allocating, spending, and recording the use of these funds. I have every confidence that all ESSA funds received will be appropriately spent by the deadline sent federally. So we thank you once again for all your work on this. And that's the chair's report. We are moving on to executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations 
with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. So we will ask the Zoom magic makers to do their Zoom magic. Mrs. Kelly? Do we need a motion to go into executive session? Yes. We oh. certainly do. Thank you. <laughs> Brian isn't here to check me on procedure. Thank you for doing so. No worries. I'll make a motion to go into executive session at 635. And a second. second. Thank you. And a roll call vote. Mr. Schoolambrini? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Archambault? Yes.
All right, it looks like we all made it back through cyberspace and um, it's time for public comment. I wanna remind the public that the first public comment section is for agenda items only. The second public comment section is open to any topic within the scope of authority of the school committee. Public comments about individual students are prohibited to protect the privacy of the student per state and federal law. It is a 10 minute session, three minutes per person. Do we have any public comment? Seeing none, then we will continue on. Um, we do not have any minutes, I believe, unless some snuck in at the last minute, nope. And there are no line, on, line item transfers this evening. Or not. So, we are on to the superintendent's report. Hopefully this is the last of the COVID <laughs> updates ever. <laughs> so. The positivity rate in Lunenburg is 6.86%. Uh, Massachusetts is at 5.92%. Cases as of June 10th were five. As of June 13th, two. And I don't have any uh, vaccination rate updates for you this evening. Uh, relative to school safety, next year as we return to school, we'll be providing an orientation for primary school parents and any parents new to the district on our ALICE protocols. Um, I am carrying forward a message from Amanda Duggan, who's one of our um, teachers. She's the teacher at the ACE program. So um, she wanted to make everyone aware that the ACE program's success is contingent upon the help of the community, ensuring that students are placed in a variety of meaningful and interesting vocational opportunities is essential. This school year, we've been fortunate enough to have local programs and businesses donate their time and resources to help our students. This has provided the students with extremely rewarding experiences that they will carry with them well past their time in the Lunenburg public school system. There are three programs or businesses that went above and beyond this school year that we would like to recognize. Joe McLaughlin and the uh, Lunenburg Public Access, Annette Queen and the Lunenburg um, Preschool Classroom, our ELC, uh, JC Nickel and all of the employees at Smokestack Roasters. Uh, we greatly appreciate your kindness and dedication to helping the community and all the students that live in it. Um, this evening, we are initiating a new model for presentations to the school committee in an attempt to abbreviate the length of meetings. We will be providing pre-recorded presentations to the school committee ahead of meetings. We'll also be posting the presentations on the website with the meeting materials. If committee members or the public have questions about the information in the presentation, they can send those questions to my office and we will happily respond. Uh, we'll try this model for a bit of time and seek some feedback later in the fall. Uh, summer hours, uh, as we did last summer, we'll be posting on our website the hours that our central office and school offices will be open to conduct business with the public. Um, as last year, those hours will be Monday through Friday, nine, uh, Monday through Thursday, nine to one. Um, we'll also be piloting a new summer work week schedule. Offices will be open Monday through Thursday for a slightly longer work day with a shorter work from home day on Fridays. Um, as you all know, there are no school programs running on Fridays through the summer. Town Hall is also closed on Friday. And Mr. Cassie and I uh, collected some data from uh, other districts and um, many have moved to a four day uh, work week in the summer months. Lastly, some reminders, tomorrow is the last day of school and it is an early release day for students and our regular meetings of the school committee will resume in August. That's all I have for you. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing a student representative. So we will move on to new business. And we have the custodial MOA revision. Mr. Cassidy. 
I would like to speak uh, to the the next three items on the the agenda. They're they're all very similar, but uh, I, I'm requesting that the school committee um, take three separate and distinct votes, um, uh, honoring and approving uh, uh, the the new federal holiday for our custodial staff and include that that date in their contract in the secretary's contract as well and included in the non-affiliated staff uh, agreement um, which um, th there's no bargaining group there but it's it, it's just a um, a practice or policy that the school committee um, uh, approves uh, as we amend it and that that affects uh, four employees uh, currently um, at uh, different rates, two full-timers and two uh, 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 part-timers who uh, work more than 20 hours a week. Um, so I would request, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them, but uh, it's really uh, three separate uh, uh, votes to approve the MOAs. And then uh, there's a separate, uh, there's some language in the memorandum that you, if you could follow, that would be, that would take care of that type of business. Um, Mrs. Kelly. Do you want me just to, I can make all three motions in a row if you'd like, if we have no questions. I don't think anyone has any questions. Um, is that procedurally okay to do three motions in a row and then just take the vote separately? Oh, we could vote on it and then I can do the next one. Whatever. I think probably that would be more solid yeah. procedural. Okay. Sure. Okay. I will make a motion to approve the amendment to the custodial agreement by adding Juneteenth to the listed paid holidays. Mr. Scombrini. Oh. Tony, you're muted. Saying? You're muted. I'll second. <laughs> All right, then a roll call vote. Mr. Scombrini? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Archambo? Yes. Okay, and I will also make a motion to approve the amendment to the secretaries and clerk agreement by adding Juneteenth to the listed paid holidays. Second. All right, and then a roll call vote. Mr. Scombrini? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Archambo? Yes. And I'll make a motion to approve the amendment to the unaffiliated staff agreement by adding Juneteenth to the listed paid holidays. I'll second. And then a roll call. Mr. Scombrini? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. And Mrs. Archambo? Yes. Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you very much. Hello, Mr. Leighton. Hello. So we're going to continue with the class of 2022 donation. So the uh, class advisor has advised us that they would, uh, the class of 2022 would be making a donation in the amount of $3,000. Um, as we've previously indicated, that would be um, directed toward um, the replacement of the scoreboard at the turf field. Very generous of our seniors. We thank them very much. Is there a motion to accept this generous donation? I'll make a motion to accept the $3,000 from the class of 2022. And a second, Ms. Shapiro? I'll second that motion. And a roll call vote. Mr. Scolombrini? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. And Mrs. Archambault. Yes. So the next item we have under new business is the district employee handbook. So you have all received a, a draft of a revised updated employee handbook. Um, we can take any questions that you might have, but we would be looking for your approval. Does anyone have any questions on the handbook? I did read through all the um, changes and everything looked fine to me. 
So then do I have a motion if no one has any questions on approving the district employee handbook? Ms. Shapiro? I'll make a motion to approve, uh, approve the district's employee handbook. <laughs> and a second, please, Mr. Leighton. I'll second that motion. And a roll call. All righty, uh, Mr. Scombrini? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. This is our Shambo. Yes. Question, Mr. Cassidy. I would like to thank uh, Liz Peterson and Penny Borderman on and uh, Nancy Forrest from town, uh, town Hall worked very hard in uh, coordinating and updating this document. So uh, I want to honor their their hard work. Thank you for pointing that out that there, there was a lot to that. There were many changes and I'm sure it was not easy to coordinate everything. So thank you. Um, next, our facility rental fee structure. So I'll invite Mr. Cassidy to this conversation. Um, you have before you an updated uh, facility rental fee structure. Um, the last time uh, we looked at fees was back in 2019. Um, as you know, um, hourly rates for uh, custodial staff um, kitchen staff, et cetera, uh, for any of these rentals, the, the salaries have increased over the last three years. And this is just um, to sort of uh, make some adjustment to, to catch us up to what the actual uh, costs would be uh, to have these staff with any facility rental. Um, we've added a couple of um, facility locations um, because we've been receiving many requests for these facilities. Um, those would be the tennis courts, the outdoor basketball courts, and a parking lot. We, we have had several requests uh, to host events in the parking lot. Um, one other um, note here is that um, we've been working with uh, different uh, members of the booster groups relative to the concession stand and some mm -hmm. upgrades to the concession stand. Um, we've been back and forth with the local board of health. We just um, had added to the conversation just this week um, that if there's a three bay sink added to the concession stand, um, we will have to have a grease trap and have the grease trap cleaned, which sort of puts us right back to the conversation we had uh, about three years ago. Um, where that cost was a prohibitive and the boosters at that point um, said that that was not something that they were interested in. Currently, as you know, we don't have a director of facilities on board. What we would like to do is have that director um, position filled, uh, hopefully in the next handful of weeks. Um, and then the director of facilities can work with us and um, Nadine Lorenz and our food service director uh, to determine what the operational costs will be if we move forward with all of these upgrades. So likely uh, at the August 31st meeting, we mm -hmm. would be back here with some uh, information relative to what the operational costs would be for rental of the concession stand. But for now, we wanted to bring these uh, uh, fee increases to you for your approval so that they can be applied to the fall rentals. Um, our Bengals and Lysa are our typical uh, fall rental organizations. Right. Mr. Cassidy, do you have anything to add? You know, it's it just a, a statement of uh, the unknown uh, with COVID uh, restrictions being lifted. And, you know, the, uh, the, the, the demand and the use in our, our facilities uh, is really unknown at this point. Obviously, the local groups, uh, the, you know, the, the Bengals, Lysa, they, they're going to use it. Uh, our, our fields, our, our facilities. It's just uh, there's been just a lot of new groups organizing, and I think everyone is, just seems to be anxious to get out and uh, organize, which is which is fantastic and we want to accommodate. I just don't know what the impact of 
you know, uh, that would be on our tennis courts, uh, uh, in our basketball courts uh, at, at the low middle, uh, at Lunenburg Middle High School. It's, uh, so these rates could go up it, it, once again in August, depending upon, um, you know, how, how we see the usage impacting um, custodian empty trash down there. If it becomes more of a hangout than, than just a permitting thing. So um, just want to put that on your radar um, uh, um, along with uh, what Dr. Burnham stated about um, the concession stand too. So, but it's good to see people anxious to, to, to get out and uh, get out in Lunenburg and, and, and get together again. So that's good. Are there any questions from the committee? Mr. Leighton. Thanks, uh, I guess I have a comment and question. So I just wanted to comment too on the tennis courts and the, the basketball courts. So I know they're running a, a youth program for the, the youth clinic for the basketball and I've dropped off my boys there and every morning it's an early morning. So there's people out there playing tennis. So I think that the public is always going to be out there using it too. We're supposed to seeing them use the courts. Um, I did have a question about the, the new position, the concession stand monitor. So I know that $50 an hour is, is definitely needed to, to pay for a monitor. I didn't know, I guess the job description of the monitor, is this going to be for every event? Is this going to be um, depending on if we have those kind of foods being served there? I know this could be a concern for say the Bengals who maybe they always have been running the concessions too. And now they're getting a, a $50 hit when they weren't even using the hot food stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll respond to that if, if Dr. Burnham or uh, Ms. Florentin wants to uh, uh, add that, that'd be great i mean it's our intent that this is uh this is a person that represents the district to making sure that surf safe uh, uh guidelines are being used once again this is an estimate it's a new position um so it's it's to protect uh the, the district from the usage in in um in that in the concession stand it is a special position. It, it does require surf state, surf safe certification. We don't anticipate it if if then if they're just uh, if they if they're following the current um, sealed food and uh, you know, it's that's not going to be needed. But I would imagine once the, uh, this person would be monitoring the event at some point, making sure that there's a surf safe person from that organization. Uh, uh, present and or if they can't get one that, that we'd be charging them $50 an hour. I think j just some of the discussions that we've had with the group um, is that they would be anxious to have some of their members um, become surf safe certified so they don't get the $50 an hour charge. Um, and um, you know it's it's a it's a training it's it it could be multiple people uh, with that group uh, and kind of rotating through during the day. So that's really our intent is, is really maintaining the Board of Health standards and making sure that the serve safe uh, practices are, are being done within the concession stand. Uh, any other comments on that, Dr. Burnham? Oh, thank you. Okay. Nadine, do you have anything to add? I, Mike sums it up pretty well. Um, I just have, is there anyone else on the committee that has any comments? Um, I just had a comment in that um, the, these um, fees for the use of the tennis court and the basketball court, they only apply to organized groups. Yes. If it's Sunday afternoon and somebody's going to shoot hoops, that does not apply to them. You know, Correct. We, happens to be open. Um, that was one thing. Another thing, um, this information is on the website, correct? These, these, be... these documents were posted with all of the documents for tonight's meeting. Okay, because um, if you're watching from home, you don't have this information. I just want to very quickly go through and say that the proposed rate per hour for custodian increase was $2. The AV support stayed the same. The kitchen was $1 per hour, and um, the field monitor was $5 per hour. 
So I just want to state what those changes were. So in case anyone is listening and doesn't happen to have that. Um, any other comments? Then do I have a motion to approve the um, FY23 facility rates? Ms. Shapiro? I'll make a motion to approve the FY23 facility rates. And a second, please. Mr. Schoolambrini? I'll second that motion. All right, and a roll call vote. Mr. Schoolambrini? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. Mrs. Oshambo? Yes. And I'd also like to thank Mrs. Lorenzen for, I know she put in an awful lot of time trying to um, work with the concession stand group and, and figuring all of this out, as well as, of course, Mr. Cassidy and the superintendent. So I thank you all very much. Thank you. All right, lunch price increase. So this evening before you, um, uh, is a vote to increase um, the school lunch prices, um, not only for our students, but also uh, for the adults. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking to increase uh, the school lunch price uh, 50 cents across the district um, so that we can be compliant, but also um, push any further increases out uh, the next couple of years so that we don't have to come back next year again for uh, a small in incremental increase. Um, the adult meal prices will also be increased um, to th uh, $3 for an adult breakfast and $5 for an adult lunch. And um, just so that everybody is aware, the free school lunch uh, is is ending. Um, so it, the last couple of years, uh, we haven't had to do any increases for the for the school lunches or breakfast. Um, Ms. Lorenzen, do you have anything to add? Um, no, just that the waivers will be ending as of the June thirtieth the waivers that allowed us to serve those free meals to students. So yeah, we're gonna be going back to our normal operational procedures and it, it is definitely time to raise the prices. Okay, are there any questions from the committee? Mr. Schoolambrini. Uh, this is a, a question, it's a comment and it is totally ridiculous. I just always have to state this is something that has bothered me since I was a kid. If you are compelled to go to school by law, it seems unfair to charge you for lunch. I, I think that there is a liberty interest at stake, but not our concern. I just wanted to put my <laughs> note of protest on the record. I have thought this since I was in first grade. So now that I'm a lawyer, I have a little bit more vocabulary to <laughs> put words to that, but it's, it's just like a pet peeve of mine. So I'm sorry. And I'm sure if five bucks for lunch is a great deal. But <laughs> all right, Mrs. Kelly. I, I also just kind of wanted to say what Tony was saying. It, it's just, you know, it, this last couple of years has been great that we've been able to offer these lunches to the kids. And um, with the cost of everything going up, like fully aware of how even a 50 cents increase is going to be hard for some families. And so I just want to say, like, we obviously emphasize with that. And we wish that this was within our control to be able to continue these free lunches. And it's disappointing that the Department of Agriculture stopped it. It really is. Mr. Layton? I'd, I'd like to make a motion that we, we draft um, language and send it to the, 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 our state legislators in, in exactly what Laura and Anthony were talking about. That's way more productive than complaining. Yeah, right? <laughs> we're just whining over here. Brian's coming up with the good solution. Well, th Thank there you, has Brian. been talk and legislators <laughs> have been talking about it and there's been proposals, but nothing's been done. And I feel yeah. like we got to use our voice. Thank you for bringing that up. That's that's definitely something we should do. I have actually reached out to our legislators. I will share a template with you that I have of a letter that I got from uh, Project Bread. Great. I will share it with the committee. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you. 
I would love that support. I, I am in full 100%. agreement that we should have free free meals. Yep. Sounds good. Um, I just had a question regarding breakfast because if if do we charge for breakfast? How, how does breakfast work? We do charge for breakfast, but right now they are not requiring that we uh, raise the price on breakfast. So how much is the breakfast currently for students? A dollar seventy-five. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, do I then have a motion to um, accept the lunch price increase? Point of order, didn't Brian place a motion before the committee? Was that a motion? Yeah. Sorry. It wasn't Sorry, a I just thought it was a, uh, we should. All right, so then we're gonna go back to Brian's motion. I will second Mr. Lightman's motion to drop the letter. And then if there's no further discussion and I haven't messed up any other protocol, we'll have a roll call vote. Mr. Schoolambrini? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. Mrs. Archambault? Yes. So when we receive the template from Mrs. Lorenzen, um, we'll figure out if we're going to do this promptly, it has to be done before the 29th. So we'll, we'll figure, we'll communicate and bring it up at the meeting on the 29th, I guess. That's what we'd have to do. Mr. Leighton? Now I'll make a motion to uh, approve the FY23 use of facilities rates. Or sorry, no, wrong. <laughs> wrong one. The, Try again. Yeah. Make a motion to approve the lunch price increases. I will and second that. I'll second that motion. All right. And if there's no further discussion, we'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Schoolambrini? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. Mrs. Oshambo? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Mrs. Lorenzen, for your work on this. And um, okay, so thank we're you. gonna move we're gonna move on to um, the AT&T antenna. So I provided you a little bit of information. Mm -hmm. This information is also posted on the website with um, meeting documents for this evening. Uh, AT&T is exploring the feasibility of the town's interest in leasing out one of the other light poles at the turf field. Uh, this would involve a replacement of the existing light post with um, a structure similar to the one currently hosting the Verizon equipment. Uh, this would result in a higher revenue stream to the town um, and also has certain advantages um, to AT&T. Um, so I provided you a little bit mm -hmm. of information relative to the existing um, antenna uh, at the turf field uh, for Verizon. Um, and for AT&T, they're looking to expand and enhance their coverage in New England. And AT&T is working um, to establish the structural framework for the federal first net program. Um, AT&T has taken a look at uh, the location and has identified um, a light pole that has potential to host um, the antenna that they're looking to install. Um, they advocate that installation of this type of facility would strengthen service along Route 2A, side streets, including residences, would strengthen the service in nearby um, schools, the elementary, the middle, and high school. Um, businesses and uh, pedestrian and vehicular traffic having access as well. Um, it will also enhance service to the center of town uh, for all of the municipal buildings. 
Um, they conducted a site visit, um, which yielded the fact that there's no space within either compound that exists uh, for, for the Verizon equipment um, to also house the AT&T ground equipment. Uh, and what they're saying is that they can design the facility either with um, a compound surrounding the tower, a standalone compound, or possibly locating their um, compound for their equipment adjacent to the existing Verizon um, equipment area. Um, there's been communication back and forth with the representative from AT&T. However, um, the communication is not always um, timely. <laughs> Stretches of time can go by uh, before we hear a response back. I did offer um, an opportunity for the representative to come before you this evening, as well as um, on, on another uh, meeting later this month. Uh, once it, once one would be scheduled. And I had not heard back, but I wanted to make you aware of what they have been looking at and what they're proposing, um, just for your consideration. I don't think that, you know, it's urgent that you vote to approve moving forward in any way, shape or form this evening. Um, and um, the town manager will be uh, later on the agenda. I know that She's currently in the room, but she'll be um, addressing the Turkey Hill uh, building project later in the agenda. Perhaps you want to delay this agenda item, and we can pick that up after the Turkey Hill discussion. You can see if the town manager has any additional information from her perspective um, that she would want for you to give consideration to. Um, that would be fine with me. I just had a question. Do we have any problems with what Verizon has on property? Has it caused any trouble? In None any that way? I'm aware of. Okay. Um, so then I would probably need a motion to um, pass over this for now. And then if um, anyone had any questions, we could ask the town manager after we discuss um, the Turkey Hill School. Uh, Mr. Leitner. A motion to table this until after we discuss Turkey Hill. And a second. Mrs. Kelly. I'll second that. And a roll call vote, please. Mr. Scolombrini. Yes. Ms. Shapiro. Yes. Mrs. Kelly. Yes. Mr. Leitner. Yes. Mrs. Archambault. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next is to ratify and approve the CBA for the Secretarial Union. Hi, uh, Mike Cassidy. Um, business manager and HR director. Uh, in, the school it, in front of the school committee tonight is a three-year contract with the uh, the secretarial uh, union in uh, the Lunenburg Public Schools. Um, uh, various uh, new language includes a um, uh, clarification on um, uh, the um, longevity and eligibility for longevity uh, and special benefits uh, comes with uh, an extra hourly rate increase and uh, additional vacation benefit for uh, service within the Lunenburg Public Schools. It also provides uh, tuition reimbursement for uh, secretaries that are willing to move forward in the um, educational field, such uh, either associates, bachelors, and or masters. And then finally, uh, there is uh, a COLA, which is uh, the first year, two and a half, second year, two and a quarter, and the final year of the th third year, three-year contract would be a 2%. Uh, the, um, 
the estimated value of, of this contract over three years is approximately $58,000 um, spread over the three year contract. I'm here to answer any questions if um, a copy of the, uh, the MOA is uh, in the shared folder. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Cassidy regarding the um, agreement? If there are no questions, then um, we would need a roll call vote. And on votes regarding um, contracts, we would include the town manager. So do we have a motion? Oh. Mr. Leitner. I'll make a motion that we ratify and approve the CBA with the secretarial union. And then a um, second, please, Ms. Shapiro. I'll second that motion. All righty, then a roll call vote. Mr. School and Brainy. Yes. Ms. Shapiro. Yes. Mrs. Kelly. Yes. Mr. Leighton. Yes. Mrs. Oshambo. Yes. And Mrs. Lemieux. Abstain. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Now we have a discussion item, the um, middle school SWOT analysis. So you have information from the SWOT analysis that was conducted with the Lunenburg Middle School staff. Um, you might recall that there was a presentation that included all of this information for the mm -hmm. other schools but this analysis had not yet been completed at that time for the middle school. So now you have um, that updated information as well. And this is also posted on the website. Is there any discussion about the SWOT analysis? Uh, let me just briefly jump in a little bit. Um, the strengths had to do with um, time for planning and collaboration, the data-driven decisions, student-centered approach, and communication and the collegial staff. The weaknesses were educational gaps pan, um, in parentheses pandemic, um, pulling staff supports to cover classes, class size, inconsistent discipline and staff diversity, opportunities, more student choice, more inclusive, more inclusion, school spirit, adapt to changing demographics and technology, and threats or barriers, social media, misuse of technology, large class size, learning gaps, changes in homework policy, decline in student stamina, and lack of diversity awareness and bullying. So is there, does anyone have any comments they wanna make about this analysis? I would just say that it, not all of the things that are troublesome, but many of the things um, are probably seen everywhere as they result from um, pandemic issues. And as our kids recover from these pandemic issues, hopefully we will be able to turn these things around. So I thank um, Mr. Santry and his team for sending us this information. And if no one else has any comments on that, we'll go on to the next discussion item, which is the curriculum end of year report. Um, I, was, I was very glad to receive the video with all the curriculum information. Everybody knows I love the curriculum part. Um, so I didn't know if anybody had any comments about the curriculum presentation. Um, I did have some comments that I had and I did ask some questions of the superintendent and I will share them with you so that people know what those answers are should they look at the 
presentation and um, have similar questions, whether it be someone on the committee or someone in the public. Um, as not everyone in the public would have seen the presentation yet, though it is posted for you. It, it did show it's iReady data, which is the program being used um, from the primary school up to the middle school to track achievement with us students. Stop me if I say something wrong, Dr. Burnham. <laughs> um, and it overwhelmingly, I was, I was a little taken aback by some things that I thought would have gone better didn't, um, particularly at the middle school level, where I know previously the MCAS scores have been fairly strong. Um, once again, I asked Dr. Burnham this afternoon if the norms that we were measuring these kids against were pre-pandemic norms, because you take a year and a half of flip-floppy life at home and flip-floppy life at school, you can't compare that to learning previously before the pandemic. And um, we do seem to think that those norms were pre-pandemic norms. So that could be a fair amount of the problem, but regardless, it still needs to be attended to. Um, so anyways, my questions were, how does iReady compare with MCAS? Does success with iReady achievement foretell MCAS results? And um, will is the iReady assessment app to show more deficits than the MCAS would? And so the answer was based on elementary data, the iReady assessment seems to be fairly predictive of MCAS performance. Um, they're looking into, Mrs. McLean is looking into the middle school data to see if that is the same. Um, I know we have, next question. I know, we, and please Mrs. Scott jump in if I mess up here. Um, I know we have a new curriculum that will help at the elementary level. What is the plan for the middle school? And obviously a more structured, logical research-based approach at the lower levels will feed into more success at the higher levels, but what happens in the interim? So the response that I received was, we are look, working to implement the student support team model that was in place at the K to five level at the middle school. And um, Mrs. Scott, Mrs. McLean and Mrs. Raboyne will work with the um, K to eight coordinators to dig in on the middle school curriculum. There is an added feature in iReady. We will have access to next year for the middle school that would allow us to identify specific standards that need to be targeted um, and I'm just going to translate that for um, people that don't have an educational background. MCAS and all of these assessment systems, regardless of which one you pick, if you pick um, rigorous ones that align with our state curriculum, they measure the state standards. The state has certain standards that they expect every student to achieve K to 12. And these assessments, iReady and MCAS, um, work on those standards. So, oh no, here we go. So there's a feature in iReady that will allow them to zoom in on those standards at the middle school next year. So I hope that was a good translation. Mr. Schoolambrini, did that translate? Yes. So, okay, this is a question I've always wanted to ask experienced educators, because I deal with it when I'm working on some juvenile cases. When you say the state standard, are you, first of all, the first question is, are you talking about like they're at grade level? I know this is really remedial and I'm sorry for asking basic questions. Mrs. Scott, you wanna jump in on that one? I'll jump in too. When we, when we reference state standard, that's the um, document uh, that is put out by the Department of Ed that includes curriculum content standards for every grade in every content area. So you can go and look at the standards for math in grade one, and it will, it, there are many standards and they will outline exactly what it is that students should 
know and be able to do. So this isn't like students get a certain test score. It's like every student should be able to add and subtract or whatever. Yeah, it's a little more, more specific than that, okay. but yes. Okay. <laughs> And, and to add on to that too, so there are grade level state standards, but part of the challenge is, for example, if you have a fourth grader and you're a, a classroom teacher, you're looking to teach what we call the tier one, the, the grade level standards to all students, but you have groups of students with gaps um, in their learning. And so, you know, if you're trying to teach a concept in math, for example, and they don't understand concepts that they should have learned previously, then we need to go and teach those concepts. But we also need to balance to make sure we're not taking too much time away from the tier one, the, the general classroom. So that's why we have small groups. We have um, intervention strategies and, you know, it's it's a large undertaking, but we are, we're working on it and tools like iReady and even formative assessments in the classroom help us to gauge where those gaps are with particular individual students or groups of students so that we can address those so that we can get students closer to grade level. And then, you know, of course, we, we don't want to um, ignore the students who are already mid or above grade level. We want to make sure we're challenging them appropriately too. So you, I, I, it, it's, a, it's a large undertaking where we're fine tuning it as we move forward. We we appreciate being able to get this data and take a look. It helps us to fine tune properly and target it. One quick follow up question to the educators. When you, is I ready scaled to Massachusetts standards or the Lunenburg School District? It, so the, the Lunenburg School District standards should be the state standards and yes, you can, using iReady, do a comparison at, to how students uh, using this iReady assessment uh, performed in the state of Massachusetts. Okay. So, so they can do a comparison of the state iReady results um, across the state and how we did compared to that, that peer group. Got it. And I'm working Just on as MCAS does an analysis where they compare your district performance against the state, we can do the same thing with this with this assessment. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, moving on. Carol. Yep, go ahead. Carol, I just had a, I guess, a comment. I, I noticed that it was a lot of it was uh, winter and then spring. I wondered if it, it's just a small gap too that maybe we can get some better data going from a, a bigger span. I wonder, I don't know, I don't know how the schedule works, but if, if a fall test and then a later spring, maybe it's a bigger gap. And also just even using previous year's data too to just get a yep. bigger picture of how the improvement's going. So you have that in the slides. Um, there's the there's um, a column that is uh, circled in red. It's the furthest column over. And that shows you um, results compared to uh, baseline, which would have been September's assessment this year. Additionally, um, Mrs. Scott and Mrs. McLean did um, an analysis and uh, created a table that compares a, a year ago to the results this spring. So we have a comparison from last year's spring to this year's spring, but we also have the comparison uh, from this fall to spring. But that data was also in the heart of the pandemic. So I feel like this is our true baseline right here. And then we're gonna grow from there. Cause and we last year we're back to normal. <laughs> yeah, we used iReady last year K through five um, for assessments three times in the year, but we were not using it at the middle school last year. So this is our first full year of middle school data. Which is why we can't speak to right now whether or not the middle school data um, is predictive of MCAS performance because this is the first year we have iReady data for the middle school level. So we'll have to see when we get the results from this spring's assessment, um, how how it lined up and whether or not it was predictive and to what extent it, it's valuable in terms of 
predicting where kids are going to end up performing on MCAS. And iReady does claim that it is a predictor. They they offer us a their sample chart, but I'm very curious to see how that compares to the actual data that we get. Um, another question I had was um, if the DESI math support group was going to continue into the next year. And I was told that um, the uh, Mrs. Raboyne and Mrs. McLean and Mrs. Scott will have access to those folks. So that support will continue as we move along. Um, I commented that students performing two years below made the greatest, below grade level made the greatest gains and um, asked if this was the group that received the greatest intervention and was told yes. So it's good to know that the inter intervention was successful. And I, then I just asked a question about um, the high quality libraries that are associated with the reading program and those libraries would be purchased. So they, they would have access to those materials in the schools. So those were my questions. Does anyone else have any other questions regarding this? I do wanna thank you for putting that together. Thank you for being the uh, first guinea pigs of our video presentation. And we'll see how this format works, but um, your work was very much appreciated. We thank you very much. Thank you very You're much. Um, and you will have the comparison with the mass, uh, with our, with I ready to mass. It'll just take me a little while, a while maybe the, by the end of the week or first of next week because I just realized how to do it. <laughs> we're still every learning week. something new every day too. <laughs> and we, we're still waiting for MCAS data for this year. So we can, sure. once that drops, we'll, we'll be on top of it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Um, under old business, we have a revised um, school calendar for next year. So before you have the uh, school calendar for next year, we recently uh, uh, went through our tiered focus monitoring visit from DESI. And uh, they were rather insistent that uh, the last day of school for seniors needed to be noted somewhere because by statute, they cannot uh, be released from school any more than, the, than 12 days from when the the whole student body is released from school. Um, so we went by the 185th day on the school calendar, counted back our 12 days, which would with five snow days, put the last day of school for seniors, um, the Friday before the first Saturday of June, which is typically our uh, graduation date. Um, we haven't had to use five snow days um, in recent years, so we're hopeful that uh, the students, the senior students last day will not be uh, the, the last day before graduation. If we had more than five snow days, we would unfortunately have to be looking at moving the graduation to the next weekend mm -hmm. so that we stay compliant. So I just need you to approve the addition with the notation of the seniors last day of school added to the calendar. So do I have any discussion on that? And do I have a motion to approve the amended school calendar? Mr. Leighton? Make a motion to approve the amended school calendar. And a second, please. Ms. Shapiro? I'll second that motion. All right, and a vote. Mr. Scombrini? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. And Mrs. Archambault? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, donated days is our next item. So I'll invite uh, Mr. Cassidy. You have uh, information uh, in your packet regarding a request uh, to provide 
donated sick days to an employee. Good evening, everyone. Mike Cassidy, uh, business manager. Uh, there's some information in the school committee folder about a uh, paraprofessional that needs uh, donated sick days. And that would be um, uh, retroactive due to scheduling conflicts. All right. Do I have a motion for that, Mrs. Kelly? Um, I will make a motion to approve up to an additional 20 donated sick days from collective bargaining members for the requesting employee to be used directly. And a second, Ms. Shapiro? I'll second that motion. And then a roll call vote. Mr. School and Brainy? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. Mrs. Archambo? Yes. Thank you, everyone. It means a lot to that employee. Thank you. Um, next is the Keystone Collaborative update. So my quarterly update for you, um, the collaborative ends the fiscal year in the black with a census 13% above projection for the year. The collaborative has been approved by the Department of Education for sites located in Shirley and Lemonster. And the collaborative is preparing for the extended school year program uh, and also working to fill uh, member district contract service needs. Are there any questions about the Keystone update? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve this update? Ms. Shapiro? Make a motion to approve the Keystone Collaborative update. And a second, please. Mrs. Kelly? I will second that. And a roll call vote. Mr. Schoolambrini? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. Mrs. Archambo? Yes. Um, the next item, which is uh, the 2022 and to 2023 school handbook revision, I believe we are passing over this evening. Correct. We just wanted to make a correction to ensure that language was consistent in all of the handbooks, um, but we just need a, a little bit of time to verify something. All right. Thank you. So the next is a discussion item that um, I'm going to give a little history on in case people have um, forgotten or weren't around when we were talking about it. And so the public understands as well. We were asked by Dr. Lynn Mann to take a look at the Massachusetts School Children Pesticide Protection Act, House Bill 926, um, last fall. And we discussed it. And it has to do with making sure there are no toxic, certain toxic chemicals are barred from school yards and, and daycares as well, I believe. And we talked about it and we had Mr. Londa weigh in on it. And we were uncomfortable endorsing this bill because we felt that it did not give enough flexibility should there be a dangerous situation like a wasp nest on the playground. You wouldn't wanna to have to tell the kids that they couldn't play on the playground for a week while we get permission from the Board of Health to use stronger pesticides or whatever. So there apparently was some motion on this bill and um, some, some change about the toxicity. I sent you all the information um, I, I'm going to be honest, I am not the insecticide person. And I don't know how far we want to go with this until our new facilities person is on board. However, this vote, the legislative session ends in July. And they are hoping that there is enough momentum behind this bill that they might be able to get it through this year. Recently, the Massachusetts Pediatric Group has approved, has approved 
this bill has endorsed it. So I didn't know if we wanted to take another look at this or this is up as discussion only, we could revote and vote on it if we wished, or if we should wait until we have another facilities manager to ask once again, if he or she is aware of a different way to go about this. So any thoughts? Mr. Leitman? Uh, I would just say that we do have uh, Anthony here, which is uh, new to the discussion. So I'm, I'm willing to join the discussion with them on that. I do agree with Carol though, that, um, that I would like to see a facilities director and, and get his opinion. I think the professional opinion of people in the facilities area would definitely be beneficial though as well. Mr. School and Brini, did you have any thoughts on this? So the, I guess the question I have was, the, the objection that you voiced, Carol, seems really sensible. What was the response of people at the state? The response was that um, the person who wrote this latest note that is in our folder, and I didn't print out her name, sorry, but that um, she had previously spent, or he, sorry, um, had spent time on a board of health and said that in his experience, board of health's work really quickly when something has gone awry. Well, I didn't think that was, I mean, some board of health's maybe work really quickly and maybe as would, I don't know. <laughs> that, that's, that's the response. Because the board of health would have to overrule the um, and allow for something slightly more potent to um, be used. Th this group's idea is that you really don't need something that strong in that particular case. And that's where we ran into disagreement with Mr. Londa. He felt that in that particular case, we would need something stronger. So, that's where we're at with this particular issue. We can table it until we have another opinion. But um, she said that she got back to the state. So I said, okay, we'll bring it up again. So I am doing my due diligence in bringing it up again. And there are many, if you go on, you can check. There are many, many school districts that have signed on to this. I don't know that ours would be a major tipping point to send this into legislation, but you never know. So um, we don't have this down as a vote. Am I getting from this discussion that we would rather wait for a um, professional opinion on this? I, I think I would. Okay. All right. Then we're going to, um, we're not going to go any further with this discussion this evening. But when we have a facilities director on board, we will bring this up again. Okay. Uh, now we have future of the Turkey Hill Elementary School. And we asked Mrs. Lemieux to attend this evening because we sort of got into this when we were talking to the municipal building committee. I'll never get all of those words right. When we were talking to them, they they were asking, you know, should we be more, um, should we push harder to have some of the things in the building remediated or you know, where are we in the pecking order here? How long do, do we think it's going to take before a building project is done? Should we start putting things on the capital plan list that need to be done in the meantime? So we asked Mrs. Lemieux for her opinion. All right, thank you for having me in tonight. And um, I assume everyone received the, the documents, the debt schedule <laughs> and the our debt policy. Um, so our debt policy really drives 
our, what we take on for additional debt. Um, we have a policy that limits our regular debt to 4% and our exempt debt to 11% of the total levy and a total aggregate debt service costs of the total levy capped at 14%. So really that um, outlines what we can take on for debt and what we have for capacity, but just looking at our debt schedule and looking at that capacity, even with those, our current debt that we have are paying annually now, that capacity limit, um, so take this year, for instance, the capacity for regular debt would be approximately 778,000 within the operating budget. So realistically, that's not achievable. Right now, um, town meeting, we closed out with approximately 200,000 um, in an additional tax levy. Um, so if we were to take on an additional 778,000 annually, um, we would have to make severe cuts elsewhere within the operating budget. If it were exempt debt, that would require a proposition two and a half override vote. So that's as additional um, hurdles to follow, but that would be outside the tax levy. And um, so really I have questions um, as well. Um, I'm If I know kind of parameters of what you're looking at for the type of debt I can, model different scenarios and what we um, have available and what we would be, have to do um, with the budget um, given those scenarios. So I guess what we're looking for is some direction. We're not, we're not trying to jump the queue. We, if, if, if it turns out the municipal building project or projects as it looks like it could be, um, come first, that's fine. But then we have to start adding some things on to capital planning to take care of, for example, one of the deficiencies in the building is an inadequate electrical service to meet the demand. I mean, the teaching and education in general has become way more electrically <laughs> Um, user, there's much more electrical usage. And, you know, your classroom with two or three plugs isn't going to do it anymore. So that that kind of thing, you know, we, is it worth our while to add those types of things on to capital planning? I guess is the question. We don't know how to go about dealing with this building. Well, there are items from Turkey Hill already in the capital planning queue. Um, those large projects are identified in the outlying years. I think there were decisions to be made um, whether they were going to be undertaken given MSBA requirements. Um, so they are identified. I can say that um, Within our regular debt schedule, we could probably take on around five million annual, you know, for uh, a cost overall, amortize over thirty years for the project. Um, that would probably fit in our debt schedule. So, what I would um, suggest is to include all the full gamut of projects in the capital planning process and until a decision is made about the direction of the overall school of whether you're gonna take on um, the large windows and roofing project, everything that needs to be done or build the new school. So yes, because the, the roof project, I believe is the next one that comes up and it was like, put down this $500,000, but who knows how much it is now with the way everything has gone up. And if we, um, the roof is not 
falling down at the moment. The roof is not showing signs of wear. That is not something that we would attack at this point in time, I don't believe, having no facility director. But from Mr. Launder's information from last fall, that, that would not be something that we need to do right now. And we can't do something that would allow MSB funds because then we can't build a new building with their funds if we already spent it in repair. Right. So, so then your recommendation at this point is to, once we have a facilities director, be able to take these items and find out what they would cost and put these items that can be fixed into the capital plan so that those things can be looked at while we are trying to figure out what the schedule is for replacement. Correct. Yeah. I think um, any known costs should be included in capital planning for replacement. Okay. Does anyone have anyone else have any questions about this? Mr. Leighton? Thank you. Um, I guess I think as a school committee too, I think we're looking for more direction on if we decided to go a new building route, what that timeline would look like in regards to connecting it with the finances of the town as well. I think that's going to be depend on the municipal building design committee and the outcome of their process of how large, large a project costs um, for town offices um, and related space will be. Um, and that timeline as far as when they would um, be looking to start construction as well. Um, it's hard for me to say, you know, you know, both are, in my mind, both will be exempt projects because of um, the expense, unless it's just um, a roof replacement and windows, which potentially could be within the operating budget. So a follow up. So is there any preparation work that the school committee needs to do in order to give an estimate to the town so they know the finances of what could be coming for a new Turkey Hill building? so that they're aware of how much money they have to budget for the town hall. Yes. So, that so we did provide that um, last year, I believe, mm -hmm. based on the numbers that are available through MSBA uh, to do that calculation. Mm -hmm. And we did, we did those numbers for both um, a, a renovation uh, type cost, I think, as well as the new build. I think what the town was looking for was a definitive direction, one way or the other. Um, and that's going to be a decision that drives how we approach the debt. So then the town is looking, is looking for us to decide whether it's a renovation or a rebuild. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes. Uh, I'll offer a comment. Uh, and this is a comment that Ms. Delanda provided um, several times uh, in the context of capital plan discussions. While he did include in the out years the costs for roof replacement, uh, et cetera, um, when we do a systems replacement, not the roof, um, we're not gonna be able to get that project done during the summer months, which now means that it impacts the school year. And I don't know that we would be able to house all of the students uh, in that building for the duration of um, a project of that scope. And we'd be talking about multiple systems replacements. Um, so you're talking about multiple potential years of disruption and relocation of students for those types of projects to be done. Um, he, he conveyed to all of you and I will convey the same. It's not, I don't think it's feasible. I don't think it's uh, the best option for us to be pursuing. 
I think it makes much more sense for us to be looking at a new build. Mr. Cassidy, do you have anything to add on that? Um, <clears throat> I have to agree with Mr. Launder again. Um, it would become a, uh, 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 troublesome to get some of those systems in place uh, without incurring additional costs like trailers or module classrooms on the side. Um, probably cost prohibitive. Um, I, I just want to, I'll say this, that we will get a smaller building than what we have if we do a new construction, the, the Turkey Hill is a big building and um, the, the new construction projects are really based upon the projections. So we will lose a little space um, in, in Turkey Hill. It'll be a, a little bit smaller building, more energy efficient and smaller. So there's some advantages to that as well. Mr. Scolombrini. Has there been any, and I, I'm, still super new, so I'm sure there has been, but has there been any thought to reassigning grades to buildings? Like the middle high school was new, but it seems like Turkey Hill has extra capacity. And if we move like one grade from the middle high school down to Turkey Hill, would that make it more viable to do a renovation versus replacement? I don't know, I'm just asking. In terms of um, the project being a bigger project space-wise? Well, like if one of the, like Mr. Cassidy brought up this idea of like modules and uh, trailers. And if part of the people were like stored at the high school for the construction and then moved down when it was finished, would that save us any money and allow us to do uh, a renovation cheaper than a replacement? So uh, I don't know that we'd be able to absorb much more than one of the three grades there. Um, okay. And we don't have any room to move anybody down to the primary school. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I think that. any way you look at it, we're looking at trailers um, during a, a reno construction. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? Mrs. Lemieux, did you want to say something? No, just sorry, I can't provide more direction, but it's <laughs> there's so many unknowns at this point. It's it's hard to, you know, give a recommendation one way or another without knowing finite dollar amounts and when construction would start, you know, looking at all the pros and cons of renovation versus um, new construction what the direction of the town is on the other town buildings. So then it appears to me that the best thing for us to do moving forward, it, it doesn't sound like if, if it is our decision, the renovate or to rebuild, it sounds like renovate is gonna be extraordinarily difficult to work around um, that, if, if it is our decision, which I thought it was the town's decision, but if it's our decision, um, you know, that's something we need to talk about in the fall. And that when we go to address capital planning, we put everything in. We will need to have hard numbers and we'll just put everything in. And um, because and Brian, you can speak better than I can about the Municipal Building Committee, but I've heard in the few meetings that I have listened to, I've heard about 12 different scenarios and none of them is going to provide any, we're not gonna land anywhere for a bit, I guess would be a broad way of saying it. Um, so, I don't think if we, we follow behind in the line, I don't see that we're gonna have a new school in five years. I, I think the estimate that I heard at FinCom more often was 10, because that, that was like two years ago. So I guess we're like at eight 
but it was figuring on the municipal building being settled, which of course it isn't. So maybe in the, in the meantime, it's best to go after those things that we can fix and, um, and get some hard data on a rebuild. I don't know. Uh, Brian, do you have a thought? I would agree with you that the town government works slow and I, I don't know what the, the new town hall is gonna look like based off of so far, the meeting so far. But I think, yeah, we, we plan with capital planning to, to do the work on Turkey Hill as needed and project it out. But also I think it seems like the committee and even the superintendent, and Mr. Cassidy as well, kind of, we all kind of, I don't know if we have to take a vote on it, but it seems like we are more interested in a new building than a complete renovation. Yeah, I would think that's something we should probably bring up and vote on in the fall. Um, we'll do a little more digging, but I know that, I, I say I know, but maybe a new facilities person would feel differently, but I don't think $500,000 for a new roof that doesn't leak right now is the way to go. And I don't know what the window situation is at this point either, but that whether you wanna invest that amount of money in a building that you think you're gonna tear down, that that's a whole different deal. So I think probably looking at a change in our capital plan regarding the Turkey Hill building is probably what we can do best for now. Mr. Leighton? I would just add to that we want to keep taking care of our buildings and uh, yes. we never know what the future use of a building is going to be, for instance, TC Passios too. So we keep taking care of it and maybe it'll get some use by the town as well for the Turkey Hill. Um, Mrs. Lemieux? Yeah, I was just going to add that um, we said about the town's, whether it was the town's decision or the school committee, I mean, ultimately it will be the town who votes on it at town mm -hmm. meeting. So, and the discussion between now and then is going to drive, you know, the outcome of that. Um, so I would say keep engaging the different town boards, um, the select board, the finance committee, the municipal building design committee, and continue that discussion to see um, what that direction will be and how what the appetite would be for um, whatever that projected cost would be for the town. Okay, anything else on this topic? then we will bring it back up in the fall. I think is probably where we're at. Thank you very much, Mrs. Lemieux for coming this evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, um, now it is time for the second public comment open to any item under the scope of authority of the school committee. Do we have another public comment? Ms. Shapiro. Hi, um, Sophie Shapiro, 144 Northfield Road. Um, it's sad as we say this, but I will be resigning from my position on the Lunenburg School Committee effective at the close of the current school year so that I can focus on my education in the final year of my undergraduate studies. Um, it has been an honor and a pleasure to serve the students, parents, and teachers in our community. And I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to hold this position for the past two years. Thank you to the members of the committee and to Dr. Burnham for a wonderful term. And thank you to the community for putting your faith in me. Thank you. Well, we, we thank you, Sophie. And um, we wish you nothing but wonderful things as you finish your education. And I wanna thank you for the time and thoughtful effort you have put in to thinking about the children in town and the students as, as they grow. So we very much appreciate everything you did for us in these last two years. Thank you. Okay, seeing um, Mr. Leitman. I just wanted to thank Sophie for her dedication, her work, uh, and, and being, being willing to share her opinions um, and her perspective as a former student. So thank you, Sophie. Mrs. Thank you. Kelly. 
So we, we came on this journey together. We started together. I feel like we learned together. So I will definitely miss, you know, learning with you. And um, you really did bring a unique perspective. And I really, really appreciate that. And definitely stay in touch. Yes, definitely. <laughs> All of you. I want to stay in touch with everyone. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Scolombrini. Sophie, I have two boys. They are 12 and 7. And I hope that they grow up to be as civically minded and as brave as you are. When you voted against what everybody else voted for in the mask mandate, I was just really blown away by your maturity and courage. And I think that that will serve you well going forward. Thank you. That's really sweet of you. Thank you. Dr. Burnham. And on behalf of uh, myself and the other administrators at Central Office, um, it has really been a pleasure to work with you and for you. Um, you will be missed for sure. It's been wonderful working with all of you too. Thank you so much. All right, any additional public comment? I see no hands raised. No. So we, we will go on to committee reports. Um, does anyone, oh, we're gonna try this a different way. So does anyone have a committee report? Let's, I'm, I'm seeing head shaking, no committee report. Mr. Leighton. The, uh, the primary school ended up not meeting uh, and we are done. For the year. The athletic advisory did meet on uh, June 6th. We did approve a field hockey uh, calendar fundraiser. Um, there was discussion about tryouts. Uh, a lot of the sports are try having their fall tryouts uh, August 22nd. There was concerns about just hiring an athletic director uh, and whether like middle school teams, middle school athletes, um, would be cut or not cut. There was some confusion last year. We just wanted a lot of uh, parents had concerns to make sure that that was clear um, uh -huh. going into the fall. Um, we're also looking for public volunteers uh, who are interested in joining some of the um, boosters. So I thought maybe we could post it on Facebook. Maybe we could um, get it in the principal's um, emails potentially or the superintendents just to even just to reach out to me if they're interested in getting involved in a booster and we can invite them to our our fall meeting it's on august 22nd at 7 p.m i thought that would be just public information that we could get out on the, the facebook uh, group that was it the uh the tc the, the municipal design building design <laughs> met, met on june 6th um, we did review some, some options. Um, we also talked about space needs and digitizing, um, files. Um, there was definitely a good consensus that the school should do this and do it in the capital plan. So that was kind of what we had talked about before. So I think we keep doing that with capital planning. Good. Um, Yeah, and uh, we're meeting in the end of June. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I just, um, Mrs. Kelly? I didn't meet, and I don't, don't know if this was for public comment, but I just wanted to say that um, I attended the primary, um, sorry, my cell just walked in. <laughs> um, I attended the uh, primary school field day and I wanted to say that they did an awesome job with putting that together because it was, I believe, the first time they had all of the um, the grades. So they did such a great job with that, but also um, the PTO event at Hollis Hills. I just wanted to say what a spectacular job they did. Um, it just was such a great way to have the community come together and um my little one was the beneficiary of a principal for the day so is that the cool principal you. behind you yeah oh principal, Kelly principal here um i wanted to say thank you to mr adams and mrs carboni because geez they, they, these kids were amazing like ride to school with hank who didn't want to do that um just the pto did a stellar job um really bringing the community together and and well done to them and to primary school okay, thank you 
uh, Mr. Scornbrini. So uh, <clears throat> we got our committee reassignments and the PTO met this week, but I got the email after the meeting. I was <laughs> in a, another meeting, so I couldn't make it, but I wanted to echo what Laura said. The PTO did a great job organizing stuff at Hollis Hills. I will note that they had a brilliant marketing tactic of undercutting the price of popcorn that Hollis Hills sold by $2 a bag. So they really scored there, but it was a great event. It was just beautiful. It was well attended. My children were thrilled because Hank was there, Hank the Comfort Dog. Uh, I, I learned that Hank's handler has a name that's not Hank's handler, as my children <laughs> call it. <laughs> so I introduced myself to Brian and said hello. It was a great, they did a great job. It was just so much fun. That's great. All right, thank you. Um, my committee report then. The Finance Committee met on the 9th of June. The meeting was mostly goal setting, looking forward to work to be done over the summer, such as um, Finance Committee goals, fiscal policies, debt planning, and capital planning policies, among other things. They will meet again on July 14th. So that's the word from there. And future topics. We have for the fall, we have to bring up Turkey Hill again and the capital planning around it. And um, once we have a uh, facilities person, we have to talk about the insecticide bill again. And what else? We have a protocol meeting we'll have to do sometime towards the end of the summer just so we're all on board with that. So if there's nothing else, we have to adjourn into executive session to discuss the reputation, character, physical condition or mental health rather than professional competence of an individual or to discuss the discipline or dismissal of or complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual. So do I have a motion? Mr. Leitman? I'll make a motion to go into executive session and adjourn following. A second. Ms. Shapiro? I'll second that motion. All righty, a roll call vote. Mr. Schoenbrini? Yes. Ms. Shapiro? Yes. Mrs. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Leighton? Yes. And Mrs. Archambault? Yes.